Thank you so much, uh, Dean, and thank you all for having me. It is really an honor to be here. You know, I sat in your shoes 12 years ago, and that's not that long ago. And so for me to get to come back and speak with all of you and address you at your commencement, it's a tremendous honor for me. So I'm really grateful that you invited me. Now, typical for Wharton grads, so for all of you, I want to succeed in everything that I do. So as I was invited here, I thought, I want to succeed in delivering the speech. I want to exceed your expectations. But what is success in a commencement speech? So I asked some of my colleagues on my campaign, I said, can you remember your commencement speaker from when they graduated with their undergraduate degrees? And most could remember the commencement speaker. And then I said, can you remember what that commencement speaker spoke about? And almost no one could. I mean, ask yourself right now, can you remember what your commencement speaker in undergrad spoke about? Well, I'm hoping that I leave you with the, you leave this and you think this was an interesting talk. And I hope that five years from now or 10 years from now, maybe I leave you with something that you remember. And if you do five years from now or 10 years from now, remember the speech, do me a favor and send me an email because I will be thrilled to hear from you. If you don't remember it, then we'll both go our separate ways and we'll forget about it and that'll be fine. So we'll remember the success, we'll forget the failure, but I hope I succeed today. Here's what I want you to take away from this. I want you to take away from this speech that we should all strive for humility. I'm going to say that again. We should all strive for humility. And I'm going to make my case to you now. You know, each of us is different. Each of us has our own hopes and our own dreams for our lives. Some people set very specific goals. Let's say you want to be a parent. You want to be a mom or dad. Or you want to be a CEO or you want to reach a certain level of economic success, or maybe you want to start your own business. Each of those goals is right. There's no right, there's no wrong. It's just customized for you. Now for me, my own life, you know, I've gone through a lot of self-reflection, which I'm gonna share with you. My own life is not about reaching a specific goal. For me, my own life is a journey. My journey that I've realized that I've been on over the past, I'm 40 years old, over most of my life, is I'm continuously seeking to pursue the biggest challenge I can find that I think is also important. So for me, it's not enough to be challenged or it's not enough to do something important. For me, I need to do something that I think is both challenging and important. So for example, if I decided to go climb a mountain, no doubt climbing a mountain would be very, very difficult, for me at least, but it wouldn't scratch my itch, my need to do something that I think is important for the greater good. And so for me, it's do something important that is also challenging. So here I am today, I'm running for governor of California. It is an extraordinarily difficult task, but it is something that I'm doing because I believe it is deeply important. Right? Our state in California, you don't see it in San Francisco, you don't see it in the Bay Area as much, but our state of California is literally failing millions of California families. We're literally ranked in California, 47th in America for jobs. We're literally ranked in California, 46th in America for education and you put those two things together, we're literally ranked in America number one for poverty once you adjust for cost of living. So to me, the chance to potentially, to take my shot, as the dean just said, to take a chance to potentially do something that could help millions of other people, I find deeply rewarding, and that's why I'm doing it. Now, I've had a number of careers in a fairly short period of time, so I started out before Wharton as an aerospace engineer. I then came to Wharton, and then I joined Goldman here in San Francisco helping startup companies raise money. <clears throat> I went to Washington for three years, then I came back to California, entered the investment business, and now I'm running for governor of California. Now, in that journey, I have met the widest range of people you can imagine. I have met some of the most successful, accomplished people in the world, and I've met people who were just desperately, desperately looking for a job. Two very big extremes. And I've met most people that I meet are in between those two extremes, right? People who are not the most successful in the world, but people who are doing all right, building a better life for themselves. Now, on the journey that I'm on, I find myself inspired by people at both ends of that spectrum. So inspired by some extraordinarily successful people that I can learn from and try to emulate, but also inspired by some people who are facing the most daunting challenges. Now, I found, Remarkably, I found some of the most successful people that I've ever met to be the most humble. And that was a little counterintuitive when I first met them. Now, it's not always true, but many times they are grateful for their success and they are dedicated to try to help other people 
have the same opportunity that they've had that has led them to that success. So I'll give you a couple examples. Some people that I've gotten to know very well, my old boss, Hank Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, or former Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke. During the financial crisis, they and we were dedicated to one thing, stabilizing the global economy on behalf of people everywhere. It wasn't about ego, it wasn't about credit, it wasn't about reward, it was about doing what was right. And I was proud to work with them, proud to learn from them. You know, there are other people that I've met only briefly, but they had a very, they made a big mark on me just meeting them for an hour. So just take Fred Smith, the CEO of FedEx. I had the privilege of sitting down with Fred for an hour, and I found this extraordinarily accomplished person to be approachable, honest, down to earth, humble, and open. And that really made an impression on me. Here's this multi-billionaire who's, who's had more success than most of us can dream about, and yet he's so humble. Or just down the street, Chuck Schwab, as is Mr. Charles Schwab. Similarly, deeply down to earth, humble, open, and honest. And that made an effect on me. You know, on the other extreme, so those are the most successful people. On the other extreme, I've met some of the most challenged people who've inspired me. So in my journey as I'm running for governor, I have visited a lot of homeless shelters around California. The reason I visit homeless shelters is because they're just like an emergency room for economic distress. And I've met people who just want a chance to work hard. They just want a job, poor families who can't afford their own place to live. And I visited this homeless shelter in Sacramento. It's called Loaves and Fishes. And I went back a few times. And the second time I was there, this young man came running up to me, 30-year-old guy. And he said, you've been here before. And I said, you're right. I have been here before. I was here a couple months ago. He said, we met. I said, I remember meeting you. I didn't remember his name. He didn't remember my name. He didn't know I was a candidate for governor. He just recognized my face. He said, I have the best news. I said, really, share with me. What's the news? He said, I got a job. I said, how in the world, how did you get a job? That's fantastic. Tell me about it. So he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out this piece of paper that he's so carefully folded in his pocket and he hands it to me. And I unfold it and it's a certificate of completion of an online course to be a security guard. And he's kept this thing like it's, you know, it's like the Bible in his pocket. It's so precious to him and he's sharing it with me. And I asked him, I said, how did you do this? How did you get this certificate? Well, this is not an overnight shelter that he's at. It's a, it provides food and services during the day. In the mornings, he would serve breakfast at the homeless shelter as a volunteer. And, and they would give him a free meal, by the way. And then in the afternoons, he would go to the public library and he found this online course and he used the public computer and he took the online course and he completed the course and he got his certificate. And I said, that's amazing. Then how did you get the job? He opened the yellow pages and he called every bar and restaurant in Sacramento and said, do you need a security guard? And one of them said yes. And then Sister Libby, the nun who runs the shelter, was his reference. And she called and she said, yes, I know this young man. He's a good, honest young person. Give him a chance. And they gave him a chance. And this guy was beaming at how his life had turned around. <clears throat> so I was obviously touched by this and inspired by this. So I asked him, I said, look, I just have to ask you, where are you sleeping? Oh, he said, oh, I'm still sleeping on the street. But my whole life <clears throat> has turned around because I got a job. Now, I'm, I'm blessed that he shared that story with me and that experience with me. And so in my journey, I found people on both ends of the spectrum to learn from and to be inspired by. And that has really touched me. But I got to be honest with you, it's not always ins inspiration. Once in a while, and it doesn't happen very frequently, but I can promise you I remember every case. Once in a while, I meet someone that really disappoints me. And honestly, I'm just, you're going to see I'm a very direct person. Usually, it's an overpaid egomaniac. Honestly, maybe a classmate of one of ours, a fellow MBA who has a big job, who's making a ton of money, and who does not appreciate how overpaid they are relative to their contribution to society. And a lot of times their ego races way ahead of reality. And it just struck me. I said, how can it be that people who are the most successful are so humble? People who are at the bottom can also be humble. And yet sometimes, sometimes those of us in the middle get a little bit confused and we lose track of where we are. 
And so I've thought a lot about that. How can people not realize what else is going on around us? And so what I've realized is that success always has three elements. Each of us, for each of us, success has three elements. Some combination of skill, that's why you're here at Wharton, to develop your skills. Some combination of hard work, no doubt you all work very hard. And some combination of luck. And we are all extremely lucky. But you know, as a society, we don't talk about luck. We, when someone has success, we hoist them up as heroes, as geniuses, and says, look at how remarkable this person is. They're a genius. And we ignore the luck that has played in getting them there. So think about, pick a year, and think about a hedge fund manager who has a great year, and they're on the cover of Fortune with the headline, genius. Are they really a genius? Or did the ball bounce in their direction this year? And maybe we should think about the role that luck plays in all of our lives. You know, I understand the tendency to ignore luck because we can emulate a successful person's hard work. We can try to emulate a successful person's skill. That's why we all went to Wharton to develop our skills. It's very hard to try to emulate luck. And so we ignore it, we discount it. But luck plays a very important role. You know, my own journey that I'm on has forced pretty intense self-reflection and a recognition of how lucky I have been. You know, I grew up middle class. My parents came to America about 50 years ago from India. I was never wanting. I had a roof over my head. I had parents who loved me. They were educated, so they saw to it that I would get that good education. Am I normal or am I lucky? I'll give you another example. I visited a boys and girls club and I met with kids aged 13 to 18 who've been in and out of jail. And in many cases, this is their last stop. They screw up again, they're headed to state prison. And I met these kids who faced such obstacles and I was just soaking it all in. And then at the end of my tour, I turned to the young woman, 25-year-old woman who was giving me the tour, and I said, before we conclude the tour, what's your story? Why are you here? And she said, I'm not interesting, I just work here. And I said, no, 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 hang on. When I was 25 years old, it never occurred to me to work at the Boys and Girls Club. Why are you here? And she sat down and she shared her story with me. She told me how, when she was a kid, the Boys and Girls Club had helped her. Because at age six, her mom went to state prison and her dad was already a drug addict. So she and her brother went into the foster system and bounced around to different foster homes for years. Then at age 10, she got placed in a stable home with a foster mom who loved her. And at age 11, she was walking down the street with her foster mom, and she saw something out of the corner of her eye. And it was the bumper sticker on a car, and she asked her foster mom, she said, what is that? And her foster mom said, oh, that's University of California Davis. It's a very good university. And she said right there at age 11, she decided, I'm going to UC Davis. So I, and I heard this, and I said, that's amazing. At age 11, you decided you're going to go to UC Davis. What did your teachers think about this? Oh, my teachers told me I have no chance. Kids like me don't go to the University of California system. We go to community college, if we're lucky. That's what her teachers told her. I said, what did your family say? She said, well, my foster mom was supportive, and she encouraged me. But my aunt, my biological mother's sister, said, why am I wasting my time? I'm going to end up in jail just like my mother. But she said, no, I'm going to UC Davis. She decided at age 11, she's going to UC Davis, and she went to UC Davis, <clears throat> and she graduated from UC Davis, and she went to graduate school, and she graduated from graduate school, and then she decided to work at the Boys and Girls Club to help other kids have the same opportunity that, they've had, that she had, to realize that they can aspire for more. They are not going to be held hostage by the circumstances of their childhood. That was also amazing to me. And so when I hear her story, and I think about my own story, and I think about my so-called hardship of having to bag groceries or mow lawns to earn extra money, I realize just how lucky I am to have been born middle class and to have had a stay, safe house and parents who could shepherd me through the education process. Let's be honest, we've all been extremely lucky. You're graduating from Wharton. I graduated from Wharton. How many more talented applicants applied every year and there are not enough seats. How did we get in? Maybe the ball bounced in our direction on the day our application landed at Wharton. We are all lucky to be here and I think we should all be grateful for that. 
I'm so fortunate myself in my own career. You know, I was working at Goldman. I was a, a vice president. I've been out of Wharton for four years. And President Bush picked the CEO of Goldman Sachs to become Treasury Secretary. What are the odds of that? So I picked up the phone and I called him up and I said, I want to come with you. I don't care if you want me to lick envelopes. I just want to come and learn and serve. And he said yes. And when I went to Treasury, I worked really hard. There's no question about that. But there's also no question if the ball had not bounced in my direction a number of times throughout my life, I would not be here today. To me, humility is the natural product of appreciating just how lucky we are. I am not so remarkable. The ball has bounced in my direction. But here's the thing, humility itself, it's not just a virtue. It's not just the product of recognizing how lucky we all are. To be honest with you, it is also in our own self-interest. Humility makes us more open to ideas. It makes us open to learning from others. It makes us open to spotting our mistakes and our shortcomings and then working to try to compensate for them. Are the extraordinarily successful people that I talked about, are they humble because of their success? Or are they successful because of their humility? I suspect it's both. I suspect that their initial success was enabled by their humility and their openness to learning. But their humility deepened as they became more successful and recognized how much support and luck they received along the way. So each of you has to determine for yourself what your hopes and dreams are, what your goals are, what your path is, what's important for you. Only you can determine that. And you should absolutely be proud of your achievement today. And all of the families should absolutely be proud of you, as I am proud of you, for your achievement. But I would ask you, in a moment of self-reflection, to ask yourself, what was your combination of work, hard work, skill, and yes, luck, that has helped you get here today? And that will absolutely take you forward. I deeply believe that if we all strive not only for success, but also for humility, I believe we will all be more successful and that our society will be stronger as well. Thank you very much.